Well, this is probably um, everyone that we're going to have. So I'll go ahead and uh, get started. So I guess before um, before we talk about this testing stuff that I want to talk about, um, it feels like we're kind of done with a phase of this club after this. Um, and so that's why I was thinking we should probably go ahead and like re pick times um, and uh, uh, you know, decide where we go next, which means we'll probably end up having next week off. I'll put the poll officially up right away after this meeting. Um, I guess this is assuming that everyone's okay with the idea of Arlang as where we go next. Um, I think it's just a super useful package and it's one that I would like to understand better. So, um, so yeah, that's the, the plan. We'll do an Arlang club. I'll post it in the channel and uh, see who all is interested, give everyone at least a week to sign up and then probably um, like a week from tomorrow, I'll choose the time and try to start that following week. Um, and it might end up being that it's the exact same time, who knows, uh, but this way we might be able to pick up some extra people. Um, or not, because it's, you know, if it's just four of us or however many are in here now. Um, that's also fine. Four to five, like four to six, I think is like the perfect size for a book club. Um, but anyway, all right. So that'll be coming into the channel uh, right after this. But for today, um, I'm going to talk about just this one uh, vignette in Shiny Test 2, and it's actually not even the entire vignette. The rest of the package is very specific to Shiny, and so I didn't think that was going to be super useful for us um, right now. Like I would do, I think it's a really useful package to dive into, but I would suggest it kind of at the end of, uh, you know, do Mastering Shiny and um, probably uh, the, the uh, Engineering Production Grade Shiny book. Mix Shiny Test 2 in there somewhere. Uh, but for us, there's this robust testing article that really belongs in test that, or a version of this belongs in test that. Um, I'm going to probably open an issue pointing that out because it's about like how tests should work, um, like the philosophy of writing tests. And I thought that was really useful to talk about. And then I'm also just going to do a really brief introduction of cover because that ties in with test that and use this. Um, and then, like I said, next is we'll just do that little discussion about uh, what we're going to do next, which we already did. So, all right, starting with robust testing. Um, this vignette is in the package. Uh, some of these, some of the articles on package down are not, but if you have a package, you can look at it there or you can look at it uh, online. Um, and so, like I said, this goes into like, you know, it's got multiple sections, but this first section is just a general, how should you think about tests? And I thought that was a really, like, really useful thing to see. So, um, you know, they, they point out that your goals when you are writing tests is you should be trying to confirm expected behavior, um, try to assert as little unnecessary information as possible, and then write clear direct tests that, you know, future you can read. And for that middle one, I don't remember if they really dive into why, but the point is you, you don't want to test to fail for nothing, that something you don't actually care about changed. Um, a, a really broad example would be like maybe the thing you're generating includes a timestamp in it. And so you don't want your test to care what that timestamp is unless you're testing that it's like within the last second or something, you know, like there could be something there, but you don't want to test for the exact behavior of it has to be at this time when I recorded this test, because that's not going to always be true. Um, and also just other, you know, if there's any other information that you don't care about, you don't want to be testing for that because then something could change in a different package and your test breaks, even though as far as you're concerned, it still works. It still does everything that you actually care about. Um, <laughs> just a random thing of, I don't know why there is a duck here. I tried to go through the GitHub history 
Do you is, have thoughts? This is supposed to be like a, uh, <clears throat> I mean, this isn't testing, but like the rubber duck uh, uh, approach that, to kind of troubleshooting. I That was my best guess. So for anyone who isn't familiar with that, uh, the rubber duck approach or rubber ducking, it's called sometimes, I think that grew out of like Google or Facebook or Twitter or somebody, but there was a- Oh, I thought um, it'd be older than that, no? I mean, it might be, but I, I feel like it, it's relatively recent. I don't know. I could be wrong. But the idea is that when you are trying to figure something out um, and you're working alone, explain it. So explaining it to someone is a great way to figure something out. And so the process or the idea was that just have like a rubber duck sitting on your desk that you explain things to. And by doing that, often you will figure out what's wrong or how, how to approach it or um, different things like that. It doesn't directly apply to this thing about what unit tests are for. So I just thought it was very strange. It was always there. Uh, this article has been edited a few times and the duck remains. So I don't know if it's like something within our studio or if I guess pause it now. Um, okay. Oh, what if uh, pro pragmatic programmer. Okay. I should read that book at some point. So um, get, where did get blame get you to? Uh, the original check-in oh, of okay. the first version of the article. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, it has been actually like formally edited, like someone um, who was, uh, I think it was when um, Jesse Mustapak started at Posit. Uh, they were an editor on this article. I think they went through to like give it a copy edit. Um, no one seemed to care unless I was missing something. But anyway, that, you know, that's not really super important, but it was just so weird that it's just a duck sitting there. Um, so, all right, we're going to be talking that the test that uh, they're demonstrating is this function uh, add abs or add absolute value of two uh, arguments. And they talk about, uh, we're going to talk about how to construct tests that, you know, follow those rules that they confirm the expected behavior. They insert assert as little unnecessary information as possible and they're clear and direct. And actually kind of a fourth thing is they, they throw in a, oh, hey, look at this. You can like write tests more programmatically than you might be thinking. And so that's kind of neat here too. So, okay. Um, they start with the, like the simplest ex expectation of, okay, uh, absolute add abs should give you the same value as X plus Y. Now we know that's not actually true because it, you know it has something else in there so if you throw in a negative number um what they you know they don't show here that this test would fail that they aren't the same because that's the point like 50 plus 42 is 92 but 50 plus negative 42 is eight and so um those tests are wrong um so they they do like a actual combo of values they do positive and negative of each thing and assert the ex actual expected value. And this is the first point where I was like, whoa, wait, what? That they do this for loop for this info in list. And then they do test that, add apps, uh, info X and info Y gives info expected. Just this, I found like really interesting and useful because there are cases where I can imagine writing tests like that. Um, so uh, that, that was cool. Um, and they, you know, they point out that you could make just like a huge vector of values and uh, make just a big mess. So uh, let's try to do as little as as necessary. Um, so one of the things that they say is like, you know, don't test um, like plus. Uh, don't test that just plus is working right. Uh, so you you know don't go overboard with the tests. Um, like, I don't know, I think there's a, I don't think they have a perfect example here, but they're, uh, the, the thing they end up with is basically, let's see, if I skim down a little bit, they do that for thing, um, and then they do their pieces um, of, sorry, the pieces being like, if you throw in NAs and nulls and uh, text, does it uh, do what you expect? Does it give the error that you expect? Um, but uh, the next thing they point out, this is the clear direct test, is 
you want your test that to test a single thing. And so this, they broke this back down to, they put the for loop, well, first they put the for loop inside of a test that, um, that is the uh, adding of the numbers. And then they separately have the non-numeric input handler test. And okay, that, that's good. That'll give you um, clearer, like, I guess to back up on that, the reason for that is that way when you run your tests, test that will tell you what actually failed. Whereas, you know, in this version, it'll just say, you know, add abs works failed. Um, if that, you know, which actually is the case here because they have a test that is um, wrong. Um, they have some tests that are wrong. Uh, so, you, you know, it just tells you that it failed. It doesn't tell you what failed. And that is, uh, you know, confusing. So the idea is try to break things down to where a test that actually tells you this is what failed. Um, I know I'm guilty of this, that I'll make big, giant, mega test thats. And then when it fails, I have to go dig in and see, okay, what, what actually failed? Um, so the idea here is break it up. So now we've got these two pieces. Um, add abs, adds two numbers, add abs, handles non-numeric input. So that's a better breakdown. And, um, you know, it'll tell us that uh, this one case, it actual is eight, expected is negative eight. Um, and that's great, but it's actually uh, not all the info, or it's not that clear yet. And so here we see another thing that, um, I mean, I must have seen, but I hadn't really grabbed that they can also send in um, this label. You can you can give expect equal a label. Whoops, sorry about that jump there. And what that'll do is they they're generating this like nice friendly um, like information about uh, what it means, what a failure means. So like they're generating a a failure message, uh, or sorry, they're generating the label on. Um, on the actual, so the label, sorry, label is the actual. So X is 50, Y is negative 42, is the actual, is not equal to info expected, um, where they say that's what the expected label is. So it's like, instead of, here, let me show you back to back, add abs, info X, info Y, actual, not equal to info expected. That's not very useful, but um, <laughs> this is actually kind of funny because I'm sure they meant for this to be eight, not, or or whatever the value is. Yeah. Um, like the expected label is not actually showing us any useful info there. Um, but, but just knowing that it's 50 and 42, or 50 and negative 42, rather, like knowing what you're, you're seeing, it's just useful to call that out. And I'm, like I said, I'm sure that back when we did expectations, like this label, and expected label arguments, those are in the help, but it didn't sink in of why that could be useful. Um, and then the other thing that they point out here is take, take that for loop and put it outside of the test that. So break down each individual test that into uh, it, its own thing. And then you don't have to do the label. So they ended up getting rid of the label stuff because then, um, sorry, they're generating the expectation. So add abs, add student numbers, colon, and then it, you know, they paste in the values that are coming in in a particular for loop. They set up the expect the single expectation for that test that, and then when it fails, it says that, you know, if this is what failed, but if you notice there's this test passed after the failure, because this one fails, but a single failure doesn't stop the whole test. And you're able to see that, okay, this other one passes. Just that philosophy, um, I found really interesting and helpful, um, especially the idea that, you know, you can set up all these things that are, it's basically the same test, put those into your for loop, and then put a test that inside of that. Um, and that's it. That's all this article. I mean, and then they go into shiny test two specific things. Um, but that concept of uh, like really break it down to where the, so that the failure messages are um, like very specific. Um, that's 
just that seemed useful. So I don't know. Anyone have any other uh, thoughts or input <laughs> about that? It's a lot to absorb. And I feel like this is one of those that I'm, I want to just keep this tab open whenever I'm working on a package and kind of look back at it and say, okay, yeah, am I breaking it down? Like, if something fails, will it tell me what failed or will it tell me what test file to look at to figure out what failed, which is what I end up doing far too often. But this should tell you, like when you run the test, it should tell you what failed. Um, not just, I mean, it, you know, it does tell you a line number. But if you have to actually go look at that line number to figure out what failed, then the test isn't doing its full purpose. I thought that was pretty, pretty good info. All right. And then the other piece that I wanted to briefly talk about, well, um, just a second, is the cover package. Um, we saw this. So if we go to, um, There's a somewhere. Nope, it's in. It must be in an article that they. Oh yeah, there. Duh, it's right there at the top. Uh, easiest way to set up cover uh, on GitHub Actions is use GitHub Action test coverage. I think we briefly looked at that uh, back in Use This. Um, there's actually uh, even easier now that I say that. There's like a use. Um, there's a specific GitHub Action around coverage, use cover GitHub action, something like that. Um, and so it's there, like we talked about it, that it's a thing that can happen, but what is cover? So cover is um, a package uh, and, and like a, um, it's linked up with sites that provide uh, information or, or track information about how much of your code is actually tested. Um, and so if we look at, uh, let's see if I've got a good example here. Um, it's not gonna show, but it it's basically uh, the, the reports will tell you number one, just like a percentage. You can see, um, you know, 47% of your code is tested. And if we look at, um, these test packages can be confusing, but if we look at, uh, I'll still see. Um, yeah, cover doesn't have code coverage. Oh yeah, it does. Okay, so cover has seventy-eight percent code coverage. And that's this little badge is generated by the GitHub action that runs cover. Um, there's, you know, that's a whole. There's a whole other discussion about like what is. Uh, good for code coverage. I have traditionally tried to aim at a hundred percent, but there are things that say like that's um, that can be overkill. That your it hides the actual errors if you are just spending all your time um, focusing on getting to a hundred percent. I I think so. I I think using exclusions to get to a hundred percent is better than leaving that twenty two percent uncovered. Um, like if it's stuff you don't care about, is uh, you should explicitly say you don't care about it. In my opinion. Um, so anyway, it generates that report, and then also it can tell you, uh, more importantly, more usefully, which lines of code in your code base are not covered by tests. And so a lot of times I will. Um, you know, I'll have some things that I test, uh, but you know, you might build in um, weird cases that you think of while you're writing the code, and then you, you know, cover will tell you, hey, you never actually test that weird case. Um, I have had cases where I do a coverage report, find that a line of code isn't covered by a test, and I try to think about like how would I test that, and I'm like, I, I can't think of any way that that would actually trigger that. Delete that line of code. Um, and so it's just, it's useful to be able to find that kind of information. Um, the other piece of information that's useful for uh, if you're working with code coverage with cover is you can put these hashtag no cov on a line of code if you don't want cover, cover to care about that line of code, or you can do no cov start, no cov end, and that will, um, 
like ignore that whole section of code. And that's what I was saying of, I, I prefer to explicitly say this code doesn't need to be covered and then aim for 100%. Um, the cases where I would do that is if, um, like I have something for uh, if GitHub is down or something, there are ways to mock that up and test it, but probably most of the time you don't need to directly test it. You might, or there are things that you might like manually test once and say, okay, that is the one case where that'll happen. Um, mostly I try not to do that too much. I, those, I don't have great examples, but um, that's how you can kind of block things out and get to a hundred percent. Um. Yeah, and that's that's basically coverage. So does anyone have any questions? Any anything about like this this package development uh genre of packages um that you're curious about? <laughs> Maybe a tangentially related question. Um uh, John, do you think that um the new version of the R package uh Packages book merits kind of a reread for people who've read earlier editions. Like, is there enough value add or, or or not? I I think probably. So I've been mostly reading along as they edit, um, but I I think I'm probably going to do that book club again at some point. Um, just or. Or maybe just on my own, it might be better to just do it on my own since lots of it I could, I, you know, you can kind of scan it and see, oh, well, that hasn't changed. But like, uh, Roxygen has changed quite a bit since the first edition of the book. And so when they're telling you how to document things, that has changed. Um, they added a lot more stuff around, uh, like all the use this and GitHub Actions type of stuff. And I think they have a whole package down section or chapter um they uh uh i think licensing is new since i read it um and they have so they have a whole chapter about how to choose licenses and what to do in special cases so uh, i do think it, it it's certainly it is better <laughs> whether it is like necessitating a reread I'd, I'd say like a re skim uh, check what the chapters are, and then I use it as a reference a lot. That, yeah. Um, I mean, already you've mentioned yeah. a few topics that I don't remember yes. being in the book. I, <laughs> either I didn't read them when I first read the book, or or yeah. And I only read the book, let's see, a year and a half ago, I guess, uh, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so, and is it still a work in progress for the second edition, or or is it uh, technically it is. It's it's uh, in um, what do they call it like um, like required changes only mode or something like that um, or how, like you know if they find out they have uh, something legally wrong or something like that they will change it or if you know like typos they would change but they're trying not to do any um, fundamental changes at this point so it's it's basically done um, don't think you can order it yet but i'll have to check that um and you know they added jenny as an author she's been doing a lot of the work on it and that's part of why it has changed quite a bit but that she's you know like a lot of her time is dedicated to working on it um there's been a fair amount of reordering the testing section it used to be a chapter it is now three chapters um things like that uh, yeah, so there is the website chapter. Um, there's some stuff about more like the life cycle chapter, I'm pretty sure is new. A lot of these chapters used to be, if they existed at all, they were like one little section within a chapter. Um, releasing the CRAN is modernized, so that's nice. Um, they talk about the uh, use this functions to help with that. So, like I say, I don't know that I would re read it. That's why I'm hesitant about actually joining a book club for it again, but re-skim and then reread the parts that are important. And you can always go to YouTube and watch uh, recent videos. Um, cohort five, 
mostly covered the final version of the book. There were some things that changed as they were going through. Um, the next cohort that will hopefully be starting soon, you know, will be using this version of the book, which is basically the final version. Um, they have actual like uh, editors from, I think it's still O'Reilly. So they have, you know, editor editors are reading it now, not just uh, us randos on the internet. Um, so yes, that, and if you haven't read this, uh, Federica and Rebecca, if you're working on packages, this book is like necessary, like, yeah. it, and it's so good. So <laughs> highly recommend. Thank you. It's all the sh <laughs> on the short list. The short list is long though, you know? <laughs> yeah. It, um, so but yeah, it really, even, really, really is. Yeah. Even with the expansion, it's, um, like, I don't think any clubs have done this recently, but when we did, did it with the first club, we grouped chapters together and did it pretty quick um, because it's a relatively quick read. And like a lot of it is more reference than stuff that you necessarily need to read all of. Like, mm -hmm. um, like you know, it's probably good to read advanced testing techniques, but mostly to know what's there. And then when you need to do, um, different things that are in there. Uh, move this window so I can see. Um, like working with test fixtures. It's good to have read through that, but so that you know that it exists when you actually want to use it. You're not going to really get it until you are using it. Um, or, you know, like maybe you don't have any data in your package and there's a whole chapter about working with data. Um, so you don't have to necessarily spend a whole week on it was the the idea when we went through it. Um, but yeah, it's a very useful book. Uh, all right. And if pressed for time, the whole game chapter gets you sort of like sixty percent of the way there. I think. Yeah, yeah, that one. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's funny actually. They. Oh yeah, there it is. Chapter six is the other one that they do the package within, and that's kind of expanding. It's taking a script and turning it into a package. Um, I still have, I think, on my GitHub, I have a package called Within, that is my version of running through that chapter and generating a package. So it's the package named Within. It's my dad joke about this book. Um, but I do have, I think, I still have that. I, I need to probably burn it down and recreate it now that they've finished the chapter, but like I had check-ins that corresponded with the sections, but then I also did some things that like my thoughts on, on expanding the, uh, what they do. Cause I take it and like turn it into a vignette within the package to, um, show kind of that development cycle. Anyway, yes, useful book. Uh, definitely recommend reading it with or without a book club. Um, we did not, so I, I guess to go back to uh, the discussion about what's next, I don't have the bottom of my, let's see, can I get there? No, I need to rearrange my windows a little bit. Um, that we had, um, so, kind of my reasoning for not going into these other things that were on the list, uh, mockery and mocker, well, they're actively changing how mocking works in test that. So I don't know, number one, there were already two packages that kind of do the same thing. And now they're building some of it into test that. And I just, I wanted to wait for that to settle down before kind of committing to what's worth really diving into. Shiny test two, like I, we talked about, it has this one useful thing and then a bunch of, I mean, it's all useful, but it's very shiny specific. Waldo, just just use it. Like you don't need to really, re, there's not much documentation there. With her, with her is useful, but it's one of those that like, just look at it and use it as you use it. Like we talked about little pieces of it. There are a whole bunch of different local um, functions that are worth, basically if you're trying to do something and you're like, oh, I got to like, you know, if you're doing uh, test fixtures from that test fixtures chapter, check with her to see if it already does it. Uh, because a lot of times it has things built in that you might be trying to struggle to set up. And then rig um, is, 
uh, it could still be useful for its own thing, but it's different. It's not a package. It's a little bit of a different idea of, okay, what exactly do we do? Um, so it doesn't like really have a package down. This is the, uh, oh, that's actually not the right URL. I broke my uh, code there. So yeah, it's it's different. And I um, didn't want to figure that out basically. And so, but it is, um, it's pretty useful. Now I will say my way of doing most of what Rig does is uh, GitHub Actions. And so I work on my own environment, but I test it on all kinds of different environments with GitHub. And that Rig is more like letting you kind of test or work in a bunch of different environments effectively. Um, so yeah, that's that's those ones. And then the uh, meta packages, like these were two all over the place. I felt like, and all of them are useful. Again, for the most part, what I would rec like this this list is available. I kind of recommend going through. Actually, it's it's early. Um, knowing that these exist is the most useful part of the documentation, and then you know go look at them as you use them. So cover, I pulled that up because it is super useful. Uh, desk is if you need to programmatically handle the description of a package for any reason. Um, I was using that to try to like uh, uh, do a bunch of parsing on um, packages I had installed or or different GitHub uh, repos or whatever. It's used by use this for the description uh, editing. Uh, Dev tools. Oh, back up. Go ahead. Yep. How how did you create this? How, how did you oh, decide I, on this overarching list of packages? Uh, so mostly I went through rlib, um, the organization rlib, which exists to generate these kinds of packages, basically. Oh. Um, and and this, so this was a fairly manual process of just looking, OK, what are all the things that are there? A lot of these are um, uh, either imports or suggests in use this or dev tools. Um, and then I don't remember, um, I think it's mostly it was use this stuff, use this connections. Was, what, it, um, what exactly is rlib as a, as a thing? It is a GitHub organization. And I think that is all it's, um, I think it's entirely within posit, but I could be okay. wrong about that. Um, so if we go to, uh, to, 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 to oops, um, nope, uh, oops, there. No, it doesn't. Okay, it doesn't have capture right holder. I guess the easy mistakes. Yeah, so cover. Oh, that's the other, that's the outside stuff. This might not have been updated yet to have a copyright holder associated. I don't know. Um, I think look to be posit. Well, oh, Jim okay, Hester so. used to work at posit. Yeah. And this one may not have been like it probably hasn't had a whole lot of it did have an update three weeks ago. Um, but just the straight up github.com slash rlib. I mean, obviously it's a ton of posit people, but I don't see. Uh, um, but it's also rlib.org. So uh, okay. I'm actually curious. Yeah, they don't have anything yet. The, the root. Over I don't know. So anyway, okay. I think it, it might not formally be our studio, um, which would be part of it. But it's the, so they have on GitHub, they have rlib, our studio, um, our open size, not them. Let's see, uh, uh, those are different ones. Um, tidyverse, tidy models. So they have several different, like separate organizations on mm -hmm. GitHub, but they're all posit. Mm -hmm. Except, I, I like, I think our lib is them. It's so, um, I think, right? That, yeah, like, um, R6, uh, R Aptors, uh, R Lang vectors are all in the R Lib organization. And those are definitely like R Studio products. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. 
Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I, I found these mostly by things that use this wraps. Um, okay. And I don't know, one or two might have snuck in, a, but these are really useful. And I can't remember. Let's see. No, I didn't include get good practice. Oh, which actually I could have gotten. So good practice is another package that isn't on this list that um, does a bunch of checks for you. I, I like it because it gives nice clean reports of, you know, this line of code is uh, long and hard to read or um, it, it does, it, it'll run cover and then show you the nice, easy to navigate report about what's uh, missing. Um, yes, thank you for the, the link. Um, DevTools could be useful to dive into. It's actually, it's kind of, um, it's just a re-export of a bunch of other packages now. They intentionally broke it down to, um, to, to be more piecemeal. The main reason for that being that when you want to install something from GitHub, you don't want to have to install DevTools and all its dependencies. You can just install remotes, for example, although I think PAC is their recommended path on that. But so DevTools is lots of different things. It's useful to have locally um, and it's useful to learn. And that one actually could be worthwhile to go through. Lifecycle, they talk about in the book, it is functions, but it's mostly like a philosophy it's uh i think we, yeah we did talk about that in the context of use this that it has the stages of um both function life cycles and uh package life cycles um the the main idea being like experimental versus stable um and but they do also have uh deprecated and not um superseded so Deprecated is they want it to go away. Superseded is they don't plan to change it. Uh, something else is the more modern take on it, but that function will still kind of be there. Uh, linter, uh, I haven't used this one as, as much as I probably should because I thought it was fully built into good practice. And then recently I started playing with it. And I don't think it is that it will go through your code and tell you things that are um, not perfect, like spacing wise, or um, you're using a weird argument here that, you know, instead you should do this. Um, so that kind of thing. So again, that one's useful to know about. It has a function that's like lint package or lint file. Those are pretty much the only functions you have to care about and then just run them. Um, package build is what happens when you do control shift L in our studio where it builds the package locally. Uh, it has a bunch of functions, but most of the time probably don't need to use them. Package down, actually, I do want to learn better. I always just use the default site right now. And um, so that one might be one I want to kind of go through. Um, I just realized that package build and package load are were mixed up in my head. So package load is the one I described. Don't remember what the heck package build is. Um, I guess, yeah, both of those actually work together for when you're building a package, luckily. Oh, uh, yeah, this is the actual like build versus load. Um, again, the um, you don't need to actually run that very often. Like our studio, you can click the build button or you can use DevTools to do a build um, and you know do what the book tells you to do at a certain step. Profviz, we just talked about in um, the Efficient R Programming Club that this is a package that I don't use nearly enough. It's built into our studio and its main thing is you can like pass code through it and it'll tell you where in that code, like how much does each step take? How much time does each step take? Um, and then help you drill down and find what is slow within code. So that is a useful thing to know about. Um, I recommend the Efficient R Programming Book Club because uh, I think we're going to be doing a lot with that. Uh, our command check, our CMD check, um, this is one that it, you can run it in our studio and it gives you a report of like this is, it'll tell you um, problems that your package has that maybe your package loads fine for you, but it'll, um, it has something weird. And uh, that's part of the CRAN process 
is the RCMD check, making sure that you don't have any issues. Uh, remote remotes is for installing um, remotes. I remote packages like off of GitHub and such. I am really kind of surprised. Um, I guess it has installing from a bunch of different sites. Um, yeah, okay, that's the main thing is, huh, <laughs> sorry, just parse GitHub repo spec uh, or remote Git repo specification. That sounds interesting. Um, so I might have to look into that a little bit of what does this do? It, it'll give you info about um, a package, although it's, I see. Okay. Um, it, again, these are used internally in other things. And so most of the time you don't need them, but if you're trying to do some weird metaprogramming, reading things about uh, different um, uh, packages on GitHub, that could be possibly useful. Rev depth check. Um, let's see, is it back on CRAN yet? Last I saw, nope, it's not on CRAN. Or is it, I guess it was never on CRAN. Um, it is for testing the reverse dependencies of a package. So once you have a package on CRAN, like if we go to remotes, does it have reverse? Um, yes, so there are packages that import remotes and there are packages that suggest remotes. If you update remotes and it causes one of these to fail, it'll get rejected uh, by CRAN. And so uh, rev depth check, it gives you a report about uh, do you have any dependencies that are gonna break with your newest version of your package? Um, something that's really interesting, just a side note on that, is it is now the policy of the Tidyverse team that if rev depth check identifies anything that's gonna break, they will submit pull requests to the other package to fix it. Um, so they don't like depend, or, so I guess a thought of that is, or a, something around that is if you're working with the tidyverse and um you know whatever you might be doing if you can turn that into a cran package uh that means that you'll get the tidyverse team to help you if they ever break your package um so you don't have to deal with it yourself i mean still good to try to keep up on that but i just i think it's really interesting that they they do that um and Yes, and yes, it is amazing. Like when they brought that up, um, I don't know like how solid, like I don't think they would appreciate me telling people to get things on CRAN just to exploit their labor. Um, but the, they do like, um, you know, there are thousands of packages that depend on uh, their packages, but they wanted to... I think the idea is they want to be able to change things when it makes sense to change them, but they don't want it to make everybody mad. And so they're trying to find a balance there. Um, anyway, so yeah, rev depth checked is useful if you have a package that is used by other packages. Um, our hub is a site for testing packages on in various scenarios, basically, and it's used as part of the CRAN submission process. If you use use this and dev tools to submit, um, and so that's another one that you don't really need to know all the details about it. it when you do the checks, it'll submit to our hub. It'll give you a report about uh, on this build your package fails, or hopefully it won't tell you. It'll tell you that it works on all the different builds. Roxygen, I do think, could be a club all in its own. Um, and that might be one that we want to do at some point because Roxygen has, um, I mean, they have 53 functions, but it also just, um, you know, rules of uh, what you can put into the, the header of uh, uh, your function to uh, build your help docs. And so uh, there are pro programmatic things you can do with Roxygen when you're building do docs. You can import pieces from other um help docs so if you have some standard thing you can use roxygen to uh standardize that across all your functions um so 
that is something that at some point I think would be useful. Um, our proj root, I can't even remember what you are at all. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, it, it, it is used inside of, um, I think both use this and dev tools, um, or it might be like, but test this, use this, um, here, and right. yeah, here. So like, yeah, lots of different packages that you might use, use this one. This is one that you probably would never have to use your call directly. Um, and so I can't remember. Yeah, like there are things, rules of what makes something the root of a package. Yeah, we don't, or of a project rather, we probably don't care in most cases to do weird things with that. So that's where I decided not to go into that one too much. Our Studio API is one that, again, it's it's feels separate enough that I didn't want to merge it into this club, uh, but it is an interesting idea to like really set up your R Studio to do things for you. Knowing how to manipulate the API helps with that, and so I think that one is useful to dive into at some point. Um, I don't think the documentation like there are things that aren't documented. Um, in the course of this club, I got help from, um, cannot remember his name right now, but he works at our studio on the, or right, works at Posit on the R studio team um, and helped me figure out how to run code when our studio loads. And like, you can actually set that it'll run when it loads for, like when it loads a project, when it loads a project for the first time. So it won't do it if you do control shift F10. Um, different things like that. Um, there are all these things that you can do in our studio. And the reason I wanted to do that is I had things that, um, oh, that was the, I, I actually automatically do the check of uh, to do our, when I load a new project so that it tells me what did I leave notes to, uh, to do. Um, and so in general, our studio API has potential for a lot of things, but um, felt like a separate club. Session info just gives you info about your session. Like it's one that's called within Reprex, but it's not, there's not a lot to do there. Uh, likewise, spelling, there is a spelling package that they recommend now in the submit to CRAN uh, steps, and it'll do some spell checking on packages. And it's nice that a package exists for this because it has some logical rules of things to ignore. Um, it does, often give you, you know, like the name of your package probably will come up as a spelling mistake, things like that. Um, but it it is, it's nice that it exists. Again, you can just like run um, one check uh, that use this will tell you what to do for it. So didn't feel like going through the help mattered a lot. Styler um, is another one actually that I feel like I might want to dive in. It, 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 it's the balance of, do I just accept what Tidyverse does? And just use their style. Um, that's mostly what I do. But there are some things that I have that are kind of my personal style, things that I prefer in a package that one of these days I need to really dive into Styler. Sorry, to back up, Styler will um, enforce a style on your package. So you can say Styler style package, and it'll go through and like um, make sure that everything's indented with two spaces instead of four spaces, or four spaces instead of two, or whatever you set it to be. And that, uh, Things mostly that things wrap in a certain way, although I can't get it to do something. I, I'm auto generating packages right now with a uh, a package that I'm writing that generates packages. And the code is ugly. And I was trying to get Styler to fix it for me. It's like, okay, I auto generate all the code and I'll put the wraps in and everything. So far, I can't get, to, get it to do that, but that's something I might have to read the documentation and get there. Test that, we actually did. URL checker is, um, it has two functions. It is a package that they wrote because CRAN started cracking down on if you have URLs that redirect and certain things like that. Uh, so it just checks things to make sure CRAN won't yell at you. Um, Waldo, like uh, like we said in the other list, is um, it just has you know it just does comparisons. So there's nothing really to read there. YAML. Um, 
YAML and YAML this. So I don't remember why they made this list other than that I was digging into some YAML stuff and um, using them is probably why they made this. Well, YAML this made this list. Uh, they are for working with YAML files and you know reading and writing the YAML files, converting them to lists or data frames or whatever, um, and working from there. Uh, I have found them useful. I am shocked looking at this that YAML this is 114 functions. Um, I was just same thing. I was scrolling through this when you started, but there are a ton. Well, I didn't know that um, like R Studio Connect huh. had so many um, yeah. options and stuff. And, and so that is, I, I wrote a function that I can't remember exactly what it does, but it's basically um, checking the namespace of the package of exported functions, which might not exactly match with, um, you know, like there, hey, this could be all 114. Sometimes some of the functions within a package don't make it onto the package down site. Um, but yeah, that's a there's a lot in there. So this one might be like if you're working with YAML a lot, this package should probably be useful to dig through, but it's a very um, you know, it's an esoteric use case. And so that's why I didn't think it was worth diving into. And that so advanced our programming packages will be coming back to these because this is where our lang lives. I think there are lots of things here that some of them on their own make sense as a book club and some of them, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, R6 makes sense as a book club, even though it only has three functions, uh, because it's a whole system of programming. Um, and then, but R Lang is a big one, 432 functions. I think that should be its own standalone club. Um, and that's why we'll be talking about that. Uh, another one. I like how many I, of those are deprecated, John? The 432? Yeah. Yeah. Because it seems like um, Arlang is sort of uh, perennially in flux, uh, although improving. Yeah. Yes. So part of it is that vectors didn't exist when they started Arlang, and a fair amount of Arlang has moved into vectors, I think. Um, vectors is like the, the class package so it's for like creating classes and and um casting things from one class to another different things like that it's all within vectors and a bunch of other things apparently because there are 184 functions there um and then but our lang is the kind of the, it's the general it's the language or the package that hadley and then uh, lionel and some other people at posit wrote to make it easier to write their other packages so it's like the heart that it's what the tidyverse is written using um, to streamline some things. It's it's uh, a little bit um, an extension of R, kind of like is a way to look at it. Some of the things are they took base R functions and standardized them. If their uh, way of calling things is a little bit different from one to another. Um, they added some uh, stricter rules on things so that, uh, well, that's a lot of what is in vectors that uh, it'll, you know, it elevates some things from nothing to a warning and it elevates other things from warning to error of things that kind of should fail if they aren't what you would expect. Um, the example or an example of that would be a lot of times vectors will um, throw an error if you don't specifically tell it that you're going to turn an integer into a logical for some check, for example, and versus base R will just say, oh, it's an integer 23. Clearly that means true. And vectors is like, yeah, is that really clear that that means true? Or could that have been a programming mistake? And so um, that's a lot of the kind of thing that they do in this. But then also Arlang has the whole, um, uh, uh, tidy data um, or tidy evaluation concept, which is uh, probably a significant part of what the book club will be <laughs> diving into is really trying to understand tidy evaluation. Um, it's how you can do some of the user-friendly stuff in the tidyverse. Like the trade-off of the tidyverse is it is uh, effort by programmers it, to make your, the life easier for users, but it makes the programmer's life way harder. And so 
um, our lang is part of that. It's like, let's make this, um, let's do it once and then reuse it all throughout the tidyverse and you know other packages that have the same idea. I assume that the name of our lang, um, I'm not familiar with Erlang, E-R-L-A-N-G, but that's programming language. I assume it is a um, like an old uh, Lisp style functioning or functional programming language. And I think I think that's probably where the name comes from. Also, just that it's things for the R language. But um, anyway, so that's the one that I plan to go to, into next. And we'll do that as a separate club. I'll put a thing in the channel. I'll figure out if we want to subdivide the channels. Um, so there might be a new uh, book club channel coming. Um, and yeah, we'll go into that and uh, we can discuss my uh, hex sticker that I want, the club R Lang. Um, all right, and so that's it. Anyone have any other thoughts before we end the call? Just thank you for hosting this. <laughs> You're welcome. I I love this club because it's stuff that, you know, like reading through all of test that I never would have done that without a club. And it's, there's some really useful stuff in there or at least potentially useful stuff in there with like the reporters, those, like uh, we had Jenny Bryan um, in the, our programming or our packages book club uh, a couple weeks ago. And I mentioned that we were reading through all of test that. And uh, she was like, oh, you know, like that's weird. <laughs> like I didn't expect anyone would do that. Did you find anything interesting? I was like, oh, that the all the the whole section on about reporters. She's like, oh yeah, I don't know how those things work. So um, it was just it was funny that like we're some of the only people who have probably ever read some of those help docs, other than whoever wrote them. Um, and I think it's really useful to know what's out there. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the Arlang stuff. Ar Arlang, if you haven't worked with Arlang, it is something that. Uh, Frequently, I have been trying to figure out how to program something I'm like that. This has to be possible. It has to be possible to make this work. And then I will stumble on or, or like I'll go through some code that I'm like, maybe this code does the same sort of thing. And it's like, oh, it just calls this Arlang function that just does the thing. Like it's not hard anymore. Arlang just handles that. Um, and so uh, I think it'll be really useful to look through all 432 functions and see which ones. Even the ones that they deprecated, it can sometimes be interesting to see like why, like, hey, we decided this is a bad idea, do it this way instead, and here's why. Um, so all of that, I think, will make uh, us better coders. So I look forward to that. John, do you happen to know if Miles McBain has kept that? He, he had a, I think, it, sort of like the beginning of Arling, he had this package that sort of, um, was a little bit of a wrapper um, for, for for Arling. I'm wondering if he kept that current, or if it's just a a tool that kind of got neglected. As maybe yeah. Arling got a little more accessible, or at least some parts uh, like the yeah. embrace operator and things like that. I I don't know. Um, I remember that package, and I I know it was pre embrace, um, and which that's the other thing that I think is going to be interesting about reading Arling is the second edition of advanced R came out and after like wrapping that up, uh, Hadley could focus on other things. And I think Lionel uh, was helping on that. And they like drastically changed how tidy evaluation works. They made it way easier to work with in our Lang. Like the old ways still work, but they, yeah. Um, so yeah, that would no longer be uh, valid because they added embracing and that like simplifies so much about tidy evaluation, which we'll talk about in the other uh, club. So I will see everyone there. I'm going to let you go now. <laughs> Thanks. 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 <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Bye.